So, good morning, everyone. So, I'm going to talk to you uh, about uh, uh, Trappist One planets and the project that uh, the project concept that led to the detection of these uh, planets, and give you a bit more detail about the status of the project. And this project is called uh, Speculose. So, uh, some of you may know that the Speculose, a real one, looks like this. It is a cookie, typical in Belgium. And here it is the acronym for search for habitable planets, eclipsing, so transiting, ultra cool stars. So it's not any transit survey, it's an exoplanet transit survey that targets ultra cool things. So what are they? Uh, ultra cool stars, well, are part of a category which is called ultra cool dwarfs, which are dwarfs with an effective temperature below 2700 Kelvin. So it's basically anything which is uh, later in spectral tides than M6. So it's a mix of brown dwarfs and, and stars. And we focus on the stellar part, because brown dwarfs are fainter, more difficult, so we focus on stars. They're also much more uh, well suited for, for life, maybe. So these uh, ultra cool stars are, are shown here in a temperature uh, size uh, diagram. You see that they go from 2,000 Kelvin to uh, 2,700 Kelvin, these ultra cool stars. We have here the brown dwarfs. Their size is more or less the size of Jupiter, so extremely small compared to the Sun. Their luminosity is only uh, a fraction of, uh, a person, uh, of a person of the solar luminosity, and their lifetime is basically, well, forever. These ultra cool stars, we have several reasons to target them. The first one is that basically it is an uncharted territory for exoplanets. You have here the distribution of the transiting planets as a function of the whole star mass. And you see that there's a very nice peak here at one, uh, because most transit surveys have targeted solar type stars. And when we enter the realm of M dwarfs, there are not so many uh, transiting planets known. And ultra cool stars are really here at the bottom of the main sequence. Here it's the brown dwarfs. And this, these planets here that have been detected are the Trappist-1 planets. So there are no other transiting planets known around an ultra cool star. And all the existing or coming missions, including the ambitious space mission like TESS or PLATO, target uh, uh, more massive stars. So this won't change. This is not explored, and we really need a, a, a survey that explores these ultra-cool stars. So the second reason is that, is that even if they are very thin, very small, Jupiter-sized things, they are quite frequent in our galaxy. We have here the distribution of the uh, 10 parsec sample as a function of the, of star, of the, of the mass, and these ultra-cool stars are here. So it's the peak uh, in uh, the, the galaxy uh, is in the red dwarf regime. The peak is in a more massive uh, mid-type M dwarf, but still the ultra cool star represents a significant fraction of the galaxy, something like 10, 15%. The third reason is that from an astrobiological point of view, they are really good targets because the habitable zone is extremely close to them. You have here the temperature of a dwarf star, the stellar distance, and you see the habitable zone that shrinks and get closer and closer to the star, and the ultra cool stars are here, really at the bottom. It corresponds to period between one and a few days. So it's really, really short, which is great for transit search and for characterization because you have more transits in the habitable zone than any other kind of stars, and you have a higher transit probability. And last but not least, these planets, because they transit very tiny star, uh, you see a comparison between the sun and uh, an ultra cool star and a, an Earth-like planet, Earth-sized planet in front of, of them, because they transit such small stars, they make it easier not only to detect transits, but also to characterize the atmosphere of an Earth-like planet. So this transit signal basically is boosted by a factor of 100. And it's very promising, especially with the James Webb Space Telescope that is coming. So you have here uh, results that are based on a, on a, on a study by uh, Carl Tenegger and Trope in 2009 for uh, an Earth twin at 10 per sec. You have the signal-to-noise ratio that was computed, assuming 200 hours on, on James Webb. And you see how, how it evolved with the OSTAR mass. 
And you see that from one solar mass to, let's say, 0.4, it doesn't change much. When you enter the uh, low mass red dwarf, it increases drastically, and it peaks at the ultra cool stars in the ultra cool stars regime. So we concluded that the best target for, uh, for James Wet, or at least a very good uh, set of targets for James Wet, would be the 1,000 nearest ultra cool stars, which have J magnitude uh, below 14, basically. So our concept is to make uh, a search, uh, which is targeting these, these stars. And we have these 1,000 ultra cool dwarfs. In fact, we have 800 stars and 200 brown dwarfs, which are bright and close enough to make possible detecting planets. And of course, a planet transiting a brown dwarf would be also interesting. So it's a targeted survey because the transits are very short in front in, this, in the habitable zone of these uh, ultra cool stars uh, because the, the star is so small and because the periods are so small, uh, they can be down to 10 minutes in duration. We need to continuously monitor each target. So basically, we stay with one telescope on one target during days, uh, something like 10, 10 nights, and then we move to another. And except if we have a transit, of course. And the tele telescope size is, uh, is, uh, is due, uh, is uh, linked, of course, to the magnitude of the object. We made some computation showing that for the brightest one, the 100 brightest one, a 60 centimeter telescope is enough to detect an Earth like planet, an Earth sized planet. If we go to the 400 brightest, you need a one meter. If you want to do the full sample, you need a two meter telescope. So we concluded that the best solution would be to build an observatory of four one-meter telescope. And first, we use it for the 400 brightest with the, the, the stars that are observed individually by one telescope. Then we combine the telescope to go to the, to the fainter part of our target list. And so the observatory in the, we have two observatory plants, one in the southern hemisphere, which is in construction. I will uh, show it after and one in the north, which is partially funded uh, so far. And we expect the survey to be completed for after five years for the brightest uh, part of our uh, target list, so GMAC below 13, and after 10 years for the others, because it takes more time, because we need to combine the telescopes. So before uh, setting up this project, we made a prototype on our uh, small robotic telescope TRAPPIST, which is located in Chile. And since uh, 2011, we have been observing uh, 50 of the brightest uh, ultra cool uh, stars, uh, including some brown dwarfs, in fact, like Lumen 16 and, and others, and also a set of 30 M6 type dwarfs. And uh, the goal of this prototype was to, uh, to assess the feasibility to detect Earth sized planets from the ground with a relatively small telescope. And so you have here real-like Earth in which we injected synthetic transit of Earth-like planets, Earth-sized planets in the habitable zone, and you see that the transits are very clear. So we concluded that we could detect Earth-sized planets. And by the way, this is the reason why we call our telescope TRAPPIST. It's a reference to monks and Belgian beers. If you want more detail, you can ask me after. And so in, in 2015, uh, we were uh, quite lucky because this prototype that was basically designed just to assess the feasibility, in fact, detected transits. It detected uh, three transiting planets uh, passing in front of a, a M8 type star located at 12 parsec, the Aquarius constellation. So you have here the transits with observed by TRAPPIST and over a bigger telescope like the VLT. And we concluded there were three planets, one with a period of 1.5 days, one with 2.4 days, and one for which we had only uh, two transits, so we call it TRAPPIST-1D, uh, but for which the orbital period was not clear. We had several solutions, so it, there were some ambiguity. So the star itself is very nearby, 12 per sec, but it was only discovered in 2000, because it's very faint in the optical, it's uh, magnitude 19 in the, in the visible, so it's very bright in the infrared, K equal 10.3, but it, it required infrared detectors, infrared surveys to be detected. So its mass, it's really at the limit between brown dwarf and stars. It, uh, it's 8% the mass of the sun. It is a solar metallicity object, which has basically a few uh, uh, giga years. And its rotation period was determined to be 3.3 days by recent uh, Kepler observations. 
So it is here compared to the sun. You can see how small it is. And we know also that it flares uh, quite frequently from TRAPPIST data and from Kepler data. We know that basically every two to three days there is a flare. And every something like three months there is a super flare. You have here a super flare observed by Kepler. And in fact it's a set of three flares, three chromospheric explosion uh, with a delta magnitude in the Kepler band of basically two. So it's a, a very uh, important energetic thing. So our vision of the system in 2015 was the following. So we had B and C planets that were not in the habitable zone, but a bit inner. They were temperate, so the effective, the, sorry, the equilibrium temperature were, be, were below uh, 400 Kelvin, but still they were not in the habitable zone, even with the extension here by Young et al. Uh, toward shorter periods. And for D, we didn't know. So there were still the interesting possibility for B and C to have a bit of liquid water on the terminator. So the terminator is uh, basically the, the edge of the, of the planet between the uh, day site and the night site hemisphere. In given models, you could have some liquid waters that accumulates here. But well, they were not clearly the best possible habitable planets. But we had a surprise. When we observe the second transit of TRAPPIST-1D, 2015, we didn't observe it only with TRAPPIST, our small telescope, but with the VLT, a 8-meter telescope, and with the Aokai instrument, a very precise uh, infrared instrument. And we got the light curve that when we reduced it in 2016, it showed us the surprise. It showed us that, in fact, this transit, which was blended with a transit of TRAPPIST-1C, uh, in fact, reveals the presence of two additional uh, bodies, not just one. So, this shows us, but what it shows here is the eclipse of three Earth sized planets passing in front of the star at the same time. So, we knew that there were more planets in the system. So, of course, we intensified our observations, and in 2016, from the ground, we got plenty and plenty of transits showing up in our data. And or things that could have been transit, like this thing, it was not clear if it was a transit or not, this one was very clear. And there were so many transits, we could not make sense of them. We, we had, because we observed from the ground, you have plenty of gaps, you have uh, the weather, you, have, you don't have access to your telescope, or so on. And so, there were many uh, ambiguities in our solution. So, we had to turn ourselves to a telescope able to solve the system. And there is one telescope that is perfect for this job. It is the Spitzer Space Telescope. Basically, it was designed to do this because it's an infrared telescope. And ultra-cool stars emit uh, mostly in the infrared. And furthermore, Spitzer, because of its Earth-trailing orbit, can observe with very high precision during weeks TRAPPIST-1 or any of the stars. So it can allow us to solve any ambiguity in a very complex system like TRAPPIST-1. And it did. You have here the light curves that we gather during three weeks in a row uh, with Spitzer. So it started in 21 September and went to October uh, 11. The green measurements here uh, were obtained from the ground because there are some gaps due to data downlink from Spitzer to Earth. So we tried to, to, to fill the gap as best that we could. You have some flares, one and two relatively big flares, well, five millimac, but it's in, in the infrared. But what is very important is that you have 34 transits during the three weeks. And with these transits, which, are, uh, which, are, which have a very high precision, and our ground-based data, we could really solve, crack the system, and conclude that it was composed of seven Earth-sized planets, uh, three of them being clearly in the habitable zone, and the four others being temperate and relatively close to the habitable zone. So this is, of course, uh, an artistic view of the planets, as we could imagine them. Uh, and they are compared here to uh, the solar system terrestrial planets. So basically, they have nearly all the same uh, size, Earth size. They have periods between 1.5 and here, 20 days. At that time, we had observed only one transit of the planet H, the hotter planet. So we just base ourselves on the transit duration to estimate its its uh, period, and the, the semi-major axis is only uh, between one and uh, five, six percent the, uh, the, the distance from the sun to the Earth. And we could also get preliminary mass measurements. I'm gonna discuss uh, them uh, afterward. 
So fortunately, uh, we were uh, not only lucky to detect this system, but we were also lucky that it was the star was very close uh, to uh, the CCD, the field of view of the campaign 12 of Kepler K2 uh, mission. So uh, Steve Owell at, uh, in, the, at the Kepler, uh, in the Kepler team tweaked it a bit, the pointing to include TRAPPIST-1 on the CCD to make possible to observe it three months in a row uh, from December uh, uh, of last year to uh, March of this year. And again, the data were really amazing with plenty of transits. So you have here the light curve obtained by Kepler in long cadence. There is also a, a short cadence version uh, with plenty, plenty of transits. It confirms all the planets. And also, very importantly, it gives us the period of the planet H, one H, for which three transits were observed by K2. And so this outer planet has a period of, now we know that it is 18.7 uh, uh, days. And from a dynamical point of view, this system is really amazing because all the planets, the triplets of planets, the adjacent triplets of planets form, uh, uh, are in free body resonance. So they're basically the orbital elements are commensurate, especially the orbital periods. So they form a long chain of resonant planets or near resonant uh, planets with two of them that are close to the habitable zone but uh, closer to the star. Four of them in the habitable zone, if you are optimistic about the habitable zone. Three, if you are a bit pessimistic. Uh, I saw a paper that says there's only one if you are very, very pessimistic. And you have one which is uh, a bit uh, out of the habitable zone, which is H. This architecture with these resonances and also the, the densities of the planet, I'm, I'm going to discuss them after, suggests that the planet formed further out and migrated uh, in what? So this is really a kind of a fingerprint of migration, this architecture. So this could suggest that this planet could have large volatile reservoirs, so water basically, which would be very interesting from an astrological point of view. And also because these planets are, form a chain of resonances, they have strong interaction between each other, which leads to strong uh, variations of the, of the crossing of the star, of the transit timings that we can use to constrain the masses of the planets. So we did preliminary, preliminary mass measurements in our paper in, in February, uh, which allowed us to get first constraint on the masses. So you have here a mass radius uh, diagram, and you have the TRAPPIST-1 planets, including H, for, for which we had no solution at that time. And you see that basically, except for this one, which for which we were relatively precise, our error bars are very large. We're talking about one sigma or two sigma error bars, uh, but still consistent with more or less Earth-like composition. For TRAPPIST-1F here, this more precise measurement was suggesting a significant volatile enrichment compared to, to Earth. They are shown here, the planets, as a function of the radius, and the, the irradiation they get compared to the one of the Earth. And basically, they cover a range which goes from Mercury to Ceres. So it's very similar to the inner solar system in terms of irradiation. B is, uh, is uh, more irradiated than Venus. C is similar to Venus. D and E similar to the Earth. F and G to Mars. And uh, H to Ceres. Uh, last week, they were... Uh, um, a publication on AstroPH uh, showing new updated masses for the planets based on the Kepler data and the Kepler timing, transit timings, and also the, the, the over da timing data set. And these results suggest that there are two planets that could have uh, Earth-like composition, D and C, and for the over, it suggests a large uh, volatile enrichment. Uh, we, are, we are still not uh, very confident with these results because some are very suspicious, notably these arrow bars here, which seems a bit weird, and also for F. Well, so this is a very complex system from a dynamical point of view, and it's very difficult from our own experience to really explore very well the parameter phase because of this strong interaction between the planets, this, uh, this uh, resonant chain. So, I'm not sure of this result. Um, very recently, we got uh, 60 new transits observation with Spitzer, 
that again confirm all the planets and allowed us to get new very precise transit timings that we are now using uh, to uh, get updated masses on the planet. So I can't show you new masses because it takes time. It is a very complex system to analyze this timing set. And uh, in addition, we could confirm the period of TRAPPIST-1 age, for which we have a very nice transit observed here. Okay, so this system is fascinating, uh, not only because of its architecture, the number of planets and so on, but also because these planets are well suited for detailed atmospheric characterization with James Webb. And even with HST, we can do things, interesting things. We can search for primary atmosphere, so uh, primordial hydrogen-rich atmosphere, this is what was done here with HST during a double transit of TRAPPIST-1 B and C. We could reel out very efficiently a primary atmosphere, at least if there is no, no clouds, very opaque clouds, which is unlikely if we believe theory. Of course, we can't constrain the, the composition of any secondary atmosphere, if there is one. HST is not enough, but it's already a, a good indication that these planets are rocky, solid planets. And we are doing this, we have done this for the other planets. I can't show you the result, but uh, they will be published very soon. And with HST, there is this paper of Barstow and Herwin, which shows that these planets will be exquisite targets, and that with a few dozens of transit, we should be able to detect ozone, methane, uh, CO2, and so on, and get really a precise atmospheric characterization for these planets. And I try to quantify this a bit to estimate the number of transits that we would need to study by transmission spectroscopy this planet, basing on Barstow and Irwin results. So to do this, I just have to rescale basically the, the main parameters in the, in, the, in the problem, which is the amplitude of the signal we're trying to detect and the signal to noise. From an observer point of view, of course, it's the main parameter. So this signal we're trying to detect, it's related to uh, the scale height of the atmosphere, uh, and it's related to the size of the star, so sorry for the equation here, but it says that uh, the signal is proportional to the size of the planet and virtually proportional to the square of the size of the star and to its temperature and inversely proportional to the mean molecular mass in the atmosphere of the atmosphere and the surface gravity. And for the signal to noise, of course, you have to take into account the, the brightness of the star in the infrared, and the number of transit and the duration of the transit. So it's basic signal-to-noise computations. And with this, I could estimate, uh, based on Barstow and Irwin results, the number of transit that we would need to characterize these planets. And this is my uh, result that I obtained for uh, these uh, TRAPPIST-1 planets. So you have here B, uh, for which uh, 20 transit would be required. You have here the amplitude of the signal we're trying to detect. Basically, it's a few uh, hundreds, if it's a few thousand of ppm up 4b to uh, more than 100 ppm, and here are all the others. Of course, when the planet is cooler, it's more difficult. When it is smaller, it's more difficult. It depends on its gravity, surface gravity, which are not very well constrained. But we can estimate that, uh, taking into account the James Webb visibility of the planet, we can estimate the number of transit and the planets are the best suited for detailed characterization. And these are the ones for which, within five years, we should have a very thorough characterization. I also included Proxima B and the new LHS 1140B. Proxima B, of course, doesn't transit, to my knowledge, but it was just for fun. If it transits, it will be, of course, an amazing target. Within a few transits, we should have a thorough characterization. And what we are trying to detect is shown here. Uh, you have here the transmission uh, spectrum of the Earth. Uh, which shows that in the infrared, uh, with near spec and MIRI on James Webb, we should be able to detect very efficiently water, CO2, ozone, uh, MIRI. In MIRI, it will be a very broad structure. Uh, in near spec, it's a shallow one, but, uh, uh, but it should be also detectable, and methane. And if you believe in, in uh, some papers, we should be able to, to detect uh, photosynthetic activity if we detect uh, ozone, oxygen, methane, and, uh, and uh, water on the planet. There's also, like uh, explained by uh, Mercedes yesterday, the possibility to study this planet from the ground with the giant telescopes that are coming. So 
Here, the reference is the paper of Mercedes and Florian Rodler. So I just rescale the uh, results, the results for the TRAPPIST-1 case and estimated the number of transit required and to detect the oxygen uh, A band at 760 nanometer uh, with the biggest uh, 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 upcoming giant telescope, the ELT, and the most promising instrument concept, GCLEF. And, well, unfortunately, the number of transit to detect oxygen is quite large. Uh, for some planets, it's completely unrealistic. A few hundreds of transit, you won't have the time to do this. But maybe for TRAPPIST-1b and F, by combining different giant telescopes, it could be done. It could be an additional uh, insight into the atmospheric properties. Uh, a problem for the habitability that has to be considered is uh, large uh, X-ray and UV irradiation of the planets. And it can be shown, it can be, uh, well, outlined it in this uh, diagram, which shows the irradiation in terms of the number of photons received compared to the Earth of the planets. And here's the flux in the XUV. And you see that these planets have irradiation which are close to the Earth in terms of, of uh, number of photons. But in the XUV, we are talking about irradiation which are dozens times larger just because the star is so close and it has a significant emission in uh, XUV. And so here also is Proxima B, which has the same problem. I don't know if it's a problem, but we know that uh, it, uh, it is there. And it is something that we, we don't know the impact on the atmosphere of the planet, if they have an atmosphere. And this will be very interesting to, uh, to, to know this observationally from the observation with James Webb, if the atmosphere uh, is there or not. What is interesting is that if these planets are volatile rich, as suggested by the TTV measurements, they will always have water. So even if they lose a few oceans of water, if they lost a few oceans of water during the, 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 the few giga years of life, they will remain, well, hundreds of oceans of water able to make an atmosphere and able to make uh, habitable conditions. And for a detail, uh, assessment of the habitability of the TRAPPIST-1 planet, I refer to the study done for Proxima Centauri, because Proxima Centauri B is a very similar case. In fact, it flares more than TRAPPIST-1, so the frequency of flare is significantly larger. So the, co the conclusion of this author is that Proxima B is still a viable candidate habitable planet for different reasons. I'm not an expert, I'm not going to enter into the detail, but they are still optimistic about the possibility to have habitable condition on this planet. So now our goal is to detect more of these systems with the Speculoos project and no more its prototype. So we have installed our first two domes at Paranal Observatory and our first telescope, which is called Europa. The telescopes are called, uh, given uh, as a function, well, to reference to the Galilean moons, so Io, Europa, Ganymede, Callisto, and uh, Io will be installed uh, in June. And the two others are coming in September and November. So our full uh, Southern Observatory should be operational uh, at the end of the year. So this is one, well, the only uh, operational telescope so far. It is Europa. It is a one-meter uh, Ritchie Chrétien telescope. It has an equatorial mount, uh, which is designed to do not have a meridian flip. If you know telescope, you know what I'm talking about. It has a, a deep depletion CCD, which is a CCD which is sensitive in the near infrared, more sensitive than the normal CCD and it's a fully robotic telescope. It's already observing uh, every night now. And our plan is also, of course, to extend to the north. We have uh, a co-I of the project, Brice Olivier de Maury, that, has, uh, get, that got the funding for a one-meter telescope to be installed in San Pedro Martí in Mexico, and 50% of the time will be devoted to telescope, to, to speculo, sorry, uh, and it should be operational in 2018. And we have also the funding, uh, a collaboration between Liège and MIT to install uh, an, another one-meter telescope, maybe in San Pedro Martir, maybe in La Palma. And we are still searching for the funding for two or three telescopes. So TRAPPIST-1 was a very good example of the, not only of the feasibility of speculoos, but also of the strategy uh, that we can use to uh, detect and confirm a study these planets. It is now very well vetted. So we have speculoos 
or trappists that should detect planets. We have the first step is to make a ground-based uh, follow-up to confirm the, the planets and get the periods and be sure we are talking about planets and no activity or something like this. Then the perfect tool to really reveal the architecture of the system is Spitzer, which is really a critical instrument in the design. Then HST can do a search for primary atmosphere, but also in the UV, it's a very, uh, it's an exquisite tool to search for exospheres. It was uh, described uh, yesterday, I think, which would indicate for TRAPPIST-1 planets the, the existence of a large water reservoir. So we are still working on this too. It is Vincent Bourrier from Geneva who is leading the effort. And of course, James Webb will be critical uh, for detailed atmospheric characterization. For the masses, here we rely on TTV. Uh, we could, couldn't be so lucky every time, so we could have planets without TTV. And this time we will rely on the infrared spectrographs that are under uh, commissioning preparation, like the Spiru uh, spectrograph. And I thank you for your attention. Basri from Berkeley. Um, so you're in the regime of stars where actually stellar activity dies. Uh, and so I would imagine that a number of your targets don't actually have much UV or X-ray emission. At least they certainly don't show H-alpha emission. And you know, a bunch of them don't flare either. So this, this could be super interesting in terms of, you know, we could actually look at planets that are around stars that don't do that and mm -hmm. compare them with stars that do do that. And yes. also, if the ones that do do it cream their planets, then the ones, these other ones wouldn't. So it does seem like a very interesting regime to be looking in. Yes, indeed. The activity seems to peak at M6, M7, and then strongly decrease. And uh, so this one is still a bit active compared to, to others. It's quiet compared to others. It's very active. So we, for, from our data so far, we have only light curves. So some light curves, some targets are very flat light curves without any flares. This one has some flares. So at the end, we will be able, when we will have a complete sample to compare the, maybe the atmospheric properties and the stellar activity and so on, it will be very interesting, yes. So one might, uh, this is Avi Loeb, uh, Harvard. One might consider the ultra cool uh, stars as the extreme uh, that we can push, perhaps brown dwarfs, you mentioned that. Uh, but there is another class of uh, stellar objects that are very common, uh, white dwarfs. And they are the end result of uh, sun-like stars. Um, mm. And uh, we do have evidence for rocky material uh, around them uh, in, in potentially the habitable zone. Yeah. At an age of a few billion years, they have a surface temperature similar to the sun. They're just smaller by a factor of 100, mm. but they have the size of the Earth. So if an Earth passes in front of them, we'll get uh, a very strong signal. Uh, is there any plan to uh, survey the white warps for potentially transiting planets? I know it has been done with the Kepler data, with K2. Uh, I know of a paper of Eric Agal suggesting to make a transit survey uh, targeting a white dwarf, but uh, I don't know any transit survey really existing. Maybe I'm ignorant about this, but uh, I don't know of, of any transit survey targeting specifically white dwarfs. Would be useful to quantify. Yes. We observe one white dwarf, which was a binary with, with a, a, an ultra cool star, and white dwarf didn't show anything, but <laughs> with one. Lisa? Yeah, I just wanted to say amazing discovery because from the model point of view, you've just given us the beautiful test case because the whole idea about the habitable zone, you know, how it shifts with less flux, with less irradiation, this is like a perfect test case when you don't have one planet, but a couple. So my sneaky question is, can we expect some interesting more test beds in the near future? <laughs> well, uh, 
if we were extremely lucky, maybe this system is rare, uh, this kind of system is rare, and speculators won't find much. But, uh, we, but I would expect that it was a normal result and that we should have uh, a dozen more systems found by speculators around bright targets and uh, maybe 20, 30 systems at the end of, of the 10 years of the survey. I'm not sure they will all uh, be uh, so coplanar and showing all the planet, it's all, its, all the system and all its beauty. But I think, yes, we will have a large sample at the end. Finger crossed. <laughs> but I have no, no other system to present now. <laughs> Ron Eakers, uh, CSIRO Australia. Uh, you and a number of other people have made comments that uh, it's a bad thing if we have flares and, uh, and high radiation fields. But in a conference I went to some time ago on the evolution of <coughs> life and intelligence, it was pointed out that mutation rates actually speed up evolution. So I'm just wondering, perhaps it's not a question to you, but to others, why is just an Earth-centric view that this is a bad thing? Having uh, high radiation fields might be a good thing. Has anybody uh, investigated this aspect? Well, from a physical point of view, planetary point of view, it's a bad thing for the atmosphere because it, in theory it should erode the atmosphere and clearly if there's no more atmosphere, the habitability is not so good. So that's, that's the, the thing. For life itself, well, I don't know. Uh, here, these planets are supposed to be tidally locked, so uh, there's one phase which doesn't receive such a large flux in UV. So, uh, I don't know. But from a biological point of view, uh, I can't say more. Um, uh, just a question. Um, it's interesting case that you have so many transits, yet you have many objects transiting. So in other stars, we learn about star spots uh, by uh, studying transits over the active region. Mm -hmm. Here you have the flaring case. It would be interesting to see if some transits uh, go across the flaring region because you have this unique combination of uh, frequent flares and frequent transits. Mm -hmm. Have you studied that case in your data? Uh, in our Spitzer data, we have some tra transits that, that show maybe spot crossing event but uh, the, the amplitude is very small because we are in the infrared, so the contrast is small. We should need a program of very high precision in the visible, but in the prime, the visible, the star is quite faint. So you will need Hubble to observe plenty and plenty of transit. So uh, with our ground-based data, we don't see the, the flare, the, the spot crossing. Um, sorry. Is it gonna explode? <laughs> Is that? This is, yeah. Lisa Carlton, Agriculture and Institute, Cornell. So uh, just going back to the question about the UV, so we are thinking about this a lot in the modeling community, and as you were saying, the problem is if you completely lose your atmosphere. However, that's incredible, hard to do if a planet still outgasses. And we just had a paper out especially for TRAPPIST-1 system looking at the UV environment on the surface. Mm -hmm. And we considered really eroded atmosphere versus non. And of course, the more you erode it, the more UV will hit the surface. And then the question is whether life, if it exists, uh, actually originates uh, below water or below uh, the surface, right? Because you can just envision if it can originate, and that's the basic question that we were trying to ask yesterday in the panel, it could adapt to radiation. There's a lot of things like, I don't know, tardigrads that are gonna be perfectly fine if you just put it there. But I think what is really interesting is what the dose flare actually gonna do to atmospheric biosignatures, and that's an open question because it's a temporal thing. Mm -hmm. And I think most of our models, what I wanted to point out, are static. So we basically go running to a full solution. And I think this is why a really active star makes even a more interesting test bed, you know, maybe not for astronauts to walk on the ground if there's not a good atmosphere. But I think this question about UV has been considered and you can just put life in sheltered condition and then come back up if it wants to evolve. You know, you don't have to be surface-based only. And I think that's a lot of times the confusion that sets in. So as I said, great test bed. <laughs> Thank you.
Hi, uh, Ed Liu, B612 Foundation. I just want to point out uh, another comment about the, the distribution of flares. For flares that are due to magnetic activity, they're nearly all power law for, for whatever star uh, due to Kong processes and plasma physics. But um, So you really shouldn't talk about you know the flaring rate in terms of X number of flares per day. You'd have to specify above some range because it's a tar law typically um, minus 1.8, something like that. Uh, so, you know, you really got this background of many smaller things with occasional larger things and so on. So it, it's going to be a lot more complicated than saying we have 0.4 flares, flares per day. Yes. So I'm basically agreeing with your point, but just a yeah, cautionary note about talking about whenever you talk about a flaring rate without mentioning the size. Yes, indeed. There are plenty of unknown. Uh, we, we just measured the brightness change. We don't know the, the flux of particles because it's another star. So it, it, we can't just relate and scale it to the, to the sun. <laughs> And to join those two comments together, um, you know, Lisa's point that, uh, that flares are a temporal phenomenon is, is a very good one, but also the fact that, uh, that flares recur and that we do have this distribution of energies means that they're also a driving force. So it's not simply something that affects the atmosphere and then the atmosphere necessarily has a chance to recover. Um, it means that chemistry, even on a place that uh, might be originally good for life in some sense, um, can be driven towards something that is not so habitable in our uh, current understanding. Yep. Any more questions?